All right, welcome to another episode of Lost Suitcases, Souls Driven by Wanderlust. I'm your host, Valerie Pennington, and we have a fantastic show for you today. I'm so excited. I hope that you want to get your, uh, your travel stories on because we have a couple of amazing guests today. Um, I don't even know where to start with you guys, but we've got Steve Eilenberg and Marie Tarter, and they are both, well, you have day jobs too, right? You're both radiologists, nothing, nothing small there, but you are both also obsessed with travel and culture and photography, and uh, uh, you own uh, Aperture Photography, correct? Aperture yeah, Photography. And uh, I am so excited because uh, they agreed to share some photos with us today and take us on a little journey of mostly the underwater world. And you guys, Marie and Steve, thank you so much for being here. I'm so excited. Thanks for having us. Yeah, Valerie, thanks a lot for the invitation. You know, when we get an invitation like this, it lets us uh, go through our images and relive some of the trips while we're putting these together. So that's a lot of fun for us as well. It's, it's, uh, it's a true labor of love. Oh, you know, taking us all over the world, so it's it, it's going to be a trip. <laughs> I'm I'm so excited. I know, like everybody, um, you guys are missing uh, travel. I certainly am as well. And so, I hope for you and our viewers that you know these little weekly doses of travel can kind of take us out of the news cycle and uh, into our happy place. For me, certainly, uh, it's my happy place. I'm also a scuba diver, and you guys are my first underwater photographers to have on the show. So for me, I'm just I am super, super excited. So I don't even know where to start. Um, your, your background, you know, how you got into photography is fascinating, where you've been. Where, where would you like to start us off? I'm just gonna ask you that. <laughs> well, it's, uh, you, got, you guys have so much stuff. I just was like overwhelmed. We, um, we thought maybe we would take uh, our viewers on kind of a virtual tour of a coral reef because uh, you know, we live on a watery planet and there's a lot to see underwater. The color, the patterns, the life, it's pretty overwhelming. It's pretty fascinating. And uh, you know, pictures are worth a thousand words. So we thought we'd maybe just like kind of jump right in there. Yeah, I, I think that's perfect. Yeah, I grew up uh, actually with a, a black and white lab. So I've been doing photography my entire life and then life got in the way. Uh, with graduate school and medical school and, and residency where I met Marie here. Uh, and I'll just throw in that our first dive experience uh, as uh, adults was actually in St. Louis, Missouri. Where we were studying to, studying to be residents. I mean, we were okay. studying to be radiologists. We were residents at the time. And um, we badly needed some diversion. We needed a, a vacation. And uh, so we were planning to go to Florida and we're like, we could learn to scuba dive and luckily we both kind of took to it uh, with equal enthusiasm and we've been diving pretty much ever since that was 1989 we moved here in 19 okay. to san diego in 1990 and for a few years we were sort of busy getting our practice you know getting up to speed in our practices and and uh, trying to make the mortgage our mortgage payment on our first house so we didn't trouble for a few years but after about 1992 once we had the ability, we, there was pretty much no stopping us. Yeah, and our first camera was maybe 1997, and we shared it, believe it or not. So uh, that didn't work out too well, and we <laughs> ended up with a well, second and then a third backup. It was a good it plan. It snowballed from there. <laughs> it was a good plan, but we you know, quickly justified getting a second one by saying, you know, we'll learn twice as fast if we both have a camera. So That is well, true. That's, that that's is true. <laughs> oh, I, I have to say... Um, Underwater photography, so I, I'm an amateur photographer and I've done, uh, my favorite is underwater macro photography because I love oh. the little guys. Mm -hmm. I guess we're going to see some nudibranchs today, my favorite. So um, yes. <laughs> but, but I have to say that it's almost, um, it, it becomes for me a balance of, you know, if I make a dive and it's like, okay, this is going to be about the photography. And sometimes you, you can almost miss what's going on because the framing and the composition and you got to worry about lights and the strobe and everything. And so I found that as the years went by, I started diving when I was 15 wow. uh, as a marine biologist. I mean, that uh -huh. was kind of essential. I started asking my dad if I could scuba dive. He said, I think when I was six, oh. Steve, that's when you got your first camera, right? So I was like, I want to go diving like Jacques Cousteau. <laughs> and, um, but it's hard. I mean, you think about all the gear you have to have. And then when you add photography on top of that, it's like, 
it's it's overwhelming and and uh, it's a commitment. That's well, for it's sure. Very true. It's uh, seven bags, two hundred pounds of gear, uh, a lot of overage fees, and uh, yep. all this fear of forgetting one little crucial O ring. But you're yep. absolutely and right. Then it's, Sometimes then it's gone. our head is in the reef looking for something tiny, and a huge thing is swimming overhead, and we won't even see it. Always, uh, yeah. always. It's, it's a risk. It happens. It's a risk. It you're right. Yes. <laughs> yes. The the big things always swim by when you have the macro lens on. <laughs> yes, that's true. That's true. I would say that okay, maybe less. Go less ahead. I'm sorry. They with yeah. cameras that they have a little yes. bit more flexibility, but in general, that's still true. That you kind of have to go down with a certain setup and a certain mindset that you were looking for big yeah. wide angle scenes, or you're looking for little bitty creatures. So you have yes. You, you still have to kind of approach it that way. If you if you go down for a muck dive, it's going to be a whale shark. It's guarantee. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> it's guarantee. Well, um, if you okay. like, we'll show you a few images, and you know, yes, let's. let the conversation go from there. Ooh, I'm excited. So we're going to share our screen and yes. uh, let's see. Okay. Don't you want my room? Yeah. You know, nice. Yeah. Ooh. Okay. So oh, perfect. That looks awesome. This was from our last trip and it's actually one of our favorite dive destinations. It's uh, Indonesia, which of course is uh, a nation basically of many, many hundreds, thousands of islands. And, uh, you know, of course, uh, this sort of makes it look like a little, little world. Um, that's actually our dive boat, the little tiny white speck right, right in the middle. It's a little skiff that we're on. Our dive boat oh, is actually somewhere goodness. around the corner, but, uh, some lucky people here in, catam in a catamaran moored wow. here and we were just tooling around after a dive you know basically blown up our nitrogen but there we are that is us. gorgeous oh my yeah. god okay this if this is your opening shot i'm like okay i'm sold <laughs> well we were lucky this enough is a nice long uh pre-pandemic trip in uh, january and february and that's from this and it was actually our 10th trip to indonesia that's how much we like it uh but this is one of the reasons why we go there. I mean, uh, hopefully it's you know, an amazing um, uh, coral reef scene with just beautiful blooming soft corals, color mm. sort of beyond belief, you know, lots of just swarming with fish. I mean, the, the amount of life, uh, most people, uh, marine biologists consider Indonesia kind of the, um, well, the maximal biodiversity on earth. Uh, yep. is sort of, you know, why we go. It's a, yeah. it's a long trek. It's uh, expensive and far away, but we think it's well worth it. Um, for those who are not marine biologists, when they look at this, they might think of almost like a bouquet of flowers. But of course, all of those things that kind of look like plants are actually animals. So some of to the right would be a sea fan, and then we've got these beautiful flower-like soft corals, but they're all basically animals, everything you're seeing in the, in the image. Yeah, there's not a plant there except in the water, <laughs> those little one-cell plants. To me, it looks like fireworks, and uh, it's mm. always a thrill uh, to be with this. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's beautiful. But of course, the, oh. <laughs> there's a lot of surprises around every corner in a coral reef, and uh, you know, one of the things I'm always uh, hoping to see, um, although I think Steve generally has has uh, more luck being a turtle whisperer, but uh, I love to see <laughs> turtles. And uh, uh, often uh, they're most approachable when they're busy feeding. So they've kind of got their mind on, you know, their next meal and they're busy foraging around the reef. And, and when that's true, that you can actually get really, really close to them. They love sponges, which is a problem because they, uh, they'll they eat their way partly through a sponge, of course, leave a lot of it and go to a next one and they have messy mouths. So uh, it's really hard to get a cooperative uh, a turtle that's uh, just starting to eat and uh, not running out of air and doesn't have a, 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 a messy face. <laughs> so so yeah. this yeah. is tricky. Just like a toddler. <laughs> oh my God, what a shot. So oh, that's spectacular. That we hope to do, you know, uh, you were exactly right about having your head buried in the reef, you know, concentrating on something, but it's always a good idea when you are on a coral reef to look up into the blue every so often because there just might be something like a manta ray soaring overhead or another, you know, nice surprise like that. Now, in this case, um, 
of course, it's easiest to approach manta rays if they are um, engaged in some activity. And you can see all the little fish um, underneath this manta ray. And that's because this is taken at what's called a cleaning station. So the manta ray needs to be rid of parasites. And all those little fish, that's what they're basically gobbling up their next meal and ridding this manta ray of parasites at the same time. They love parasites. Uh, you wouldn't know it looking at this, but we were in a ripping current. Uh, we actually had, really, yeah, we had anchor lines on us. Basically, we were <sighs> hooked into the reef, and uh, these guys are so powerful. A slight, slight flip of, the, of their uh, uh, wings, and they are holding rock solid. So we may be with this guy as he's being cleaned for maybe ten or fifteen minutes, literally eyeball to eyeball. This is wow. quite wide angle, so he may be twelve to fifteen feet across. Uh, wow. very powerful and he didn't seem to mind and certainly we didn't seem to mind uh, but it was uh, it was dramatic that is spectacular oh and you know same principle applies here if you're lucky maybe you can see a, a pair of uh, eagle rays swimming by these uh, this pair i actually uh, saw in uh, french polynesia last year uh, with, that is a very exciting dive destination that we've only discovered in the last couple of years. And we liked it so much we went last year and the year before. Um, very, very exciting diving. And this was also taken in French uh. Polynesia. And of course, you know, if you're lucky and you're, you're in a coral reef, maybe you'll see a shark swim by. But if you want to see sharks in much more numerous quantities, a destination like uh, French Polynesia, this is actually taken in a remote um, island called Fakarava, which has what they call the Wall of Sharks. River and of Sharks? The Wall of Sharks. In a river. It's a deep channel, basically, um, with water, you know, rushing either from the ocean into a lagoon. Whoops. Or... Oh, my God. Oops, oh I boy. Think he's, oh, Whoops. Sorry, I think we're having a little technical... That's okay. Someone touched the mouse accidentally. <laughs> Get all reorganized here. But, uh, no problem. Anyway, that uh, that place was very impressive. The the wall of sharks. Um, wow. Because um, you know, obviously, you see the one that's kind of front and center. But there's at least I would say two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve, mm -hmm. like twenty more in the frame. And at times, we were literally seeing just you know a cavalcade of sharks, one after the other, after the other. It was a very impressive sight. I, I need to say, I just need to say to the viewers, because the number one question I get asked when people uh, hear scared? that I'm a scuba diver is, are you scared of sharks? And I say, absolutely not, because, you know, you're, you're, you're lucky to see sharks underwater. Usually sharks see people and they swim the other way before, before well, you've even had a chance to see them. I do, however, say that what does scare me underwater are the transparent things that can kill you that you don't see. I, those, those are the things to worry about, but sharks, Absolutely. sharks are magical to see. Yeah, yeah. box jellies and, and boat ladders uh, can yeah. kill you. Yeah. <laughs> boat boat ladders. Like, boat, boats can be a problem. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah I, I'm, I'm scared of boats, that's for sure. Yeah. That is, that is beautiful. Sharks are <clears throat> usually, you are absolutely correct that, um, like if in a, a random encounter, like, you know, on a, on a coral reef, it's kind of rare that they would actually approach close enough for a good shot because yeah, you really yeah. want to, them to be, say, six to 10 feet away. And in a place like Fakarava, where it's literally just a stream of sharks, and what we're doing is we're just hunkering down at the edge of this channel, and it's just like a continuous stream of sharks going by, some close, some far. But your chances of you know them approaching close enough for a good shot are obviously increased in that kind of situation. Yeah. They do sneak up yeah. in you sometimes. You turn around and there often be one right there. Yeah. Uh, not menacing, but uh, they they just do not like bubbles. They don't like the sound of us. Um, yeah. That's not to say that when they mean business, they they can really do a job on uh, on their prey. But uh, we're it's not a risk to us really at all. Yeah. Yeah. So one of the things we oh. love about Indonesia is, well, for starters, it is a remote enough destination. And although it is, there's definitely more dive pressure on it than there was the first time we went, uh, probably 12 years ago, it's still remarkably healthy, remarkably pristine. Um, you've got just an incredible amount of 
healthy growth in life. So here we've got just a, like a wall of red sea fans. Um, at the bottom right, you've got a red gorgonian and then just the fish life is incredible. But, you know, one thing we love about the underwater world is that, you know, if you take a step closer and say, look even more closely on one, just one of these animals, you know, of course, it <laughs> is home to, you know, a whole um, group of animals that it supports. So each one of those yeah. animals is like an ecosystem unto itself. So here's a close up of a Gorgonian and you can see this beautiful little crab that perfectly matches it. Um, you know, that's no accident. Nature's pretty amazing mm. in it. uh, its uh, schemes for camouflage. Yeah, oh, and, and when we uh, actually have this on, on our computer and we're cleaning up the image, maybe we'll see eggs or we'll see another animal peering out from another corner. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Interesting, some animals actually, they want to blend in and then we've, we've actually encountered some fish uh, that can actually change color to show the parasites off better when they're being cleaned. So it's absolutely ingenious and uh, never ceases to amaze. So, oh. yes, yeah, this is a marvelous species oh. that shows one of the smallest inhabitants of the coral reef. It's, uh, in fact, these were only discovered, oh, I would say less than 20 years ago, a pygmy seahorse. And now there's, it's known that there are several different species of them. They are nearly microscopic. Um, I have, I don't think I've ever seen one on my own that is without the aid of a good dive guide pointing yep. them out. So it's, you know, first you have to find the right type of sea fan or gorgonian that they live on, and then you have to have a very sharp eye. Um, but they are literally in the, you know, when you, somebody might show you one, but when you put your eye behind the camera, you've already lost it. So it's very technically very difficult. To... Yeah, the depth of field here is maybe two millimeters. And uh, oh it may look God. like I shot this at night, but this is actually shot during the day. It's just the way the camera was set up that it blacked out the background. They move like they're arthritic and they, and they have moved one direction and that's away from you. <laughs> yeah. So even if you've got it in the viewfinder, very likely they're very slowly and very with little jerky motions move away and basically give you a butt shot. So uh, it, oh, is that, really it is really tricky. That is, that is amazing. I've only seen them in books. I've, I've never had, yeah, the, I've never had the pleasure. That beautiful. is incredible. <gasps> oh. So in oh, that's book, gorgeous. Yeah, so that, those are two animals. So the background is a long rope-like, it's called a whip coral. And so it literally looks sort of like a rope uh, or, um, you know, a long strand of coral that projects out from a reef. But the same thing, you know, if you look closely enough, that is home to one or more creatures. So, you know, and I never see, I'm constantly amazed at uh, the camouflage schemes because not only will these animals be the same color, maybe the same, you know, body orientation, but even the same texture. Uh, usually perfectly mimicking uh, the substrate they live on. So yeah. here are the feeding tentacles of the whip coral. So what we might do in a situation like this is actually seek out an attractive whip coral, maybe one that's not brown or sort of uh, putty colored, and assume that we're going to find some animal on it. So sometimes what we'll do is we'll just put our hands very close to it and spook the animal. And when it moves, it gives itself away. Uh, of course, like the pygmy seahorse, it wants to go on the other side of the uh, whip coral. So not only do you have to basically, sometimes you're, you're mid-water, you're not rooted on the ground yourself as a photographer, and you're trying to coax it to the other side with one hand and keep it in focus with the other hand. It's, it's really a, a difficult thing. It would be nice to have a, uh, an underwater animal herder, but, you know, uh, I'm busy shooting and Marie's busy shooting and we're seldom available to each other. But the eyes on this guy, these, these, yeah. be these beautiful blue eyes, just yep. gorgeous. And you really don't appreciate it at the time. It's basically after the dive where you see what you got. That's very true that yeah. uh, a lot of these details are, uh, that are so intricate that you actually have a much better chance of appreciating how ingenious and marvelous they are afterwards uh, so because true. you can blow it up you can study it as steve mentioned sometimes there'll be a surprise animal like riding on the head of the one that you were concentrating on that you didn't even notice or something in the background yes so 
But even down in the sand, you know, uh, there can be, there's a whole um, universe of animals, yeah. many of which are very small. And you mentioned muck diving earlier. Yeah. So this is something we also enjoy. Muck diving, for those who aren't divers, it doesn't sound real appealing. In fact, <laughs> at first glance, it doesn't look that appealing because often it'll be, say, a volcanic sand slope. And it'll look, frankly, a little barren at first glance. It'll just look like sand with little tufts of, uh, you know, plant-like algae and things like that. If you're lucky, other times there are diapers and, and old shoes and, and uh, typewriters and well, that's tires. True too. <laughs> but living amongst those things are some of the most exotic creatures. So sometimes it's not particularly glamorous. Uh, having a nice sand substrate with, with interesting creatures is nice, but a uh, good deal of the time we're actually going through real muck, human muck. So sometimes um, there are real surprises though. And uh, so that's one, though obviously that takes experience. Um, a, a good dive guide is, is uh, you know, there's no substitute for local knowledge and that is one arena where that is really, really true. Um, yep. So what is this? This is a flamboyant cuttlefish, and it's a real tiny guy. He's probably about um, two inches long. If that. If that. This one. And um, they can, when, like, now this looks like a colorful, easy to spot guy, and that's true when it is moving, but when it's sort of like more contracted, it can actually look kind of like a seed pod that, you know, uh, fell in from a tree next to the next to the beach. So it can be pretty well disguised until it's on the hunt. Um, in which case, like suddenly the colors will start flashing. And so they're quite mesmerizing to watch. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know if the, if the, if the color display as they're about to feed is, is just pure excitement or whether it's meant to mesmerize or confuse I, the prey. That's what I've read. I, I do believe that that's, and, and I've actually seen prey who it, it, it's almost like they become hypnotized by it. And as, as the cuttlefish, you know, they, and this is something that if you've never seen it, you know, cuttlefish and octopus and, you know, squid, they can do these, and they have so many different types of cells on their skin. They can change the color, the texture, how much light gets reflected. They can match the substrate. They're, they're incredible. And the prey actually get sort of hypnotized by it and they'll just suddenly stop moving and just watch as like the waves of light pass over these animals. And and actually as a diver, I have to say, I've had the same experience. <laughs> I'm also just like, oh, oh me too. Yeah. <laughs> me too. Amazing, I, I, amazing. It's, no, it's, it's, it's something that is very difficult to, until you've seen it, it's hard to believe how, yeah. how beautiful it is. So this guy, yeah. these are some modified uh, tentacles that it's using, like look like ears, and it's actually walking on them. And in the center here are a couple of others that are not visible right now, but they're uh, basically the feeding tentacles that will shoot out maybe a, a one or two entire body lengths of this creature and maybe grab a little shrimp and bring it back in its mouth in maybe a tenth of a second. It's just amazing. I have to say that the human equivalent to this, like the closest we can get is blushing. Uh, okay. And, and, that's, and, and that's, that's just not very cool <laughs> compared <laughs> to all this. Oh my God. Speak of the devil. Look at this. Yeah, this is um, a very famous critter. Uh, oh yes. Called a blue ringed octopus. And it is actually phenomenally poisonous if it were able to actually transmit its poison to you. Fortunately, this guy is so small, it, it, it he's, oh, again, inch, about an inch one. and a half, maybe, maybe an inch, depending on the, the specimen. But, um, the, and often, the, the, I, I've only found a couple on my own. This was one of the ones I found on my own, and I got lucky there because I was literally just exiting a dive site. I was following my guide and a friend, and all of a sudden, I got this flash of what I call eggplant blue, this amazing blue color, out of the corner of my eye. And there's very few things that are that color. So it just was just enough to kind of catch my attention and make me turn back. And there was this guy. Ordinarily, but, they look a lot like a little piece of, uh, what do you say, algae. A little blob of algae, like a little, little brown blob of nothing until they start moving and start displaying those incredible blue rings. But the photography here is tricky as well because 
you have to first make him comfortable with you and then you have to sort of piss him off a little bit uh, to make him flash the blue. So again, like the other uh, whip coral uh, example where you're trying to chase the animal to the other side, on this one you might be basically focusing and getting ready to shoot him and maybe doing this with your hand to actually can you see uh, no me? actually yeah I can, I can see you you're yeah, yeah. you're small oh, yeah. on the tile can... and so actually you're doing mm -hmm. this and it's flashing blue and then fading away and flashing uh -huh. blue, fading yeah away. i will say i never did that this guy just put on a little show for me well, you're special uh, i have to i have to do that i i did not have to do that I, it was it was <laughs> like, a, like a pretty miraculous uh she's the octopus whisperer how far <laughs> away were you from that guy <gasps> uh, very close, very close okay. because okay. Um, I was shooting with like a 105 millimeter five macro inches? lens, okay. probably about five inches away. Okay, got it. Oh, that that is just, oh jeez, you guys are killing me. It's a little bobtail squid, again, another one that uh, can change color drastically. The other thing they do to hide is they, they burrow into the sand and you can see how small he is because those are grains of sand that he's perched right. on. So and he, also, he's got a few grains of sand on perched head. up on top of him, right, uh, right here. between his eyes. Yeah, so these guys want to get messy very quickly. They want to go into the sand and disappear, and all you'll see is an eye or two. Um, so it's very tricky to get one that's out and, 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 uh, and not covered with sand. This is about as good as it gets. Uh, I probably fanned some of the sand off of him, uh, and he probably, a, a second after this, he went under the sand. Yeah, yeah they, have a, they do a very good disappearing act very quickly. Oh. And you know, who's this guy's barber? Maybe this is a, a maybe pandemic. The pandemic, yeah. yeah. <laughs> COVID-19 hair. <laughs> yeah, but you know, you can't make this stuff up. No, you know, no. These crazy serrata and beautiful eye colors. It's, uh, and they have such, such uh, interesting expressions. I don't know what is really going on in their heads, of course, but they look uh, surprised and shocked and, and uh, <laughs> happy and anxious. So, you know, Every second or two, they're changing their expressions. This is a very ordinary uh, creature. This is a, the uh, razor coral, um, kind of a cousin to sand dollars. It is also, of course, an animal uh, with the feeding polyps that will come up uh, when it's feeding. Uh, very simple composition, beautiful colors, just amazing architecture. Uh, very common animal, um, but just extraordinary. And, you know, the, the typical coral reef is just filled with innumerable things that are equally interesting and varied and diverse. So it, there's just like no shortage of subjects. Oh. Everybody knows who so this guy cute. is. Of course. Yes, yes. He has <laughs> this is, uh, the common name is a skunk anemone fish, the skunk because of the white stripe. Uh, and sort of like looking for a good whip coral to shoot an animal on, we might I frequently will go to an interesting uh, uh, soft coral like this or uh, anemone that has beautiful coloration uh, and then see what is living on it. Or uh, wait, yeah. or perhaps wait for something good to come along. Well, these yeah. are gonna be, these are gonna be living there. So yeah. you're sort of stuck with them and they're sort of stuck with you for the time being, but uh, <laughs> very protective, uh, very aggressive, uh, sometimes comically so, especially if they have eggs around. And speaking of anemone fish <laughs> eggs, um, so they can get kind of uh, protective when they are uh, brooding a patch of eggs. And so how do we, how we get clued into that is that they may be kind of hovering and acting even more defensive than normal. And we're looking for a little sort of discolored patch of uh, what, when you actually magnify way up, you, you can actually see the little um, eyes forming of these uh, future anemone fish. This would be like a fuzzy patch on a rock next to the anemone. And uh, a tip off would be uh, if the anemone fish swims, you know, maybe five or 10 feet off of the anemone to try to chase you away, go, ha, there's something good here. And they also yes. kind yes. of um, uh, fan, it. fan it to presumably to maybe bring in oxygenated water. Yeah, right. increase right. The, the nutritional content of the local environment. But it's important have, also to realize that uh, you know, we do have an impact on these, on these creatures. And if they're chasing us away, there are other animals that are coming in to eat their eggs. So there's a real balancing act between getting a shot and, and actually disturbing nature. Uh, I think the numbers are on their side, but again, I don't like being part of that. 
I'm really, really glad that you brought that up because that is something that I've seen, you know, all over the world. And it is really tough because, you know, people like you who can share photographs like this, you know, you are doing so much good in showing most of the, I mean, most humans will never get to see this for themselves, right? And after being exposed to images like this, maybe people will be more concerned about the health of our oceans. So there's a lot of good that comes of it. But you're exactly right. You know, when you look at some of the sites where, you know, there, there's so much uh, pressure from dive uh, operations and especially, you know, there are many parts of the world where there are only a small number of dive sites. And so everybody goes there. And after a few years, you know, the areas are decimated. So it is really important to support, you know, dive organizations and, and countries that are committed to this balance and conservation. And like, I love it when they require divers to get you know, some level of, you know, knowledge and understanding, or you have to buy a, like a, a pass, right. like a, you know, for like a national park kind of a thing. And part of that includes training, you know, don't touch the, don't touch anything. And also I love it when you're not allowed to wear gloves because divers who wear gloves grab onto stuff all the time. So, you know, it's, uh, I, I appreciate your comment because sometimes when you are just by being there, you know, animals are expending precious energy to defend themselves against what they perceive as a huge threat. Um, and that might leave them, you know, without enough energy to defend themselves against, you know, natural predators. So I'm always conscious of that. And, but I feel that, you know, the balance of education and, and sharing this kind of knowledge, I think, I think it's, I think it's worth it in the big picture. Oh, yeah, but I think it's, it's important for viewers to realize that, that people like us do take that into consideration, uh, in a big I'm way that perhaps you know one i mean obviously i just assume the pandemic be over and that we could start to travel again but there may be like a little sliver of a silver lining there that you know some of these reefs are kind of getting a break from uh divers and boats and uh pressure from, I, I actually have yeah some friends that are studying that precise question and they're measuring, I have some in the Caribbean that are doing this, and they're looking at what is the impact of the mm -hmm. complete absence of divers on these reefs. Mm -hmm. We're more and, likely to go with an outfit that has, uh, that has uh, basically installed mooring lines and not dropping yes. anchors. Yes, very, very important. No more dropping anchors yeah. mm -hmm. into, into a coral reef, into a coral reef, I need to, yeah. to say that. This, this shot in Indonesia was on Cannibal Rock, which is an unbelievable dive site that has been decimated with uh, dynamite fisher, Not fishing. Not completely, partially. Uh, a good deal oh of it is gosh. gone. Uh, this is certainly when it was at its most pristine. And I think after this dive, you know, we, we talked about if you could dive one place for the rest of your life, you know, it's like what meal, you know, what meal would you have if you had to have it the rest of your life? Yes. What dive site would you have for the rest this of your life? This would be a contender. And Cannibal Rock was right there. And we haven't been there wow. maybe five or six years, but we hear a large part of it on top is decimated with uh, which is a terrible. So is this uh, is this where candy corn comes from? Perhaps <laughs> <laughs> certainly has the coloration, but this this is something. Called, but again, the common name is a sea apple, and this is the dual purpose mouth here, and uh, this is called a ladybug. It's a little uh, arthropod uh, with just great colorations. It's maybe. Two it's millimeters? microscopic. No, no, two millimeters, three millimeters, it's, maybe. It's very difficult to see with the eye. Yeah. The sea apple itself is mm, like the size of a big fist, let's say, but the the cantaloupe. Oh, a small cantaloupe. Okay, the size of a small cantaloupe. <laughs> and um, but that ladybug, I, honestly, I have trouble seeing them. Uh, wow. I think. Uh, yeah <laughs> like with the eye they're difficult yeah to yeah that would be something i think you would see after the fact so you saw it when you were taking the shot uh yeah i was aware that okay. there were, that's and that's okay. a really good thing somebody might say to you you know steve i, I see you love shooting macro there's a crazy creature down there i'm going to point to it and make some sort of a sign and look for it because this is where the ladybugs live and okay. uh so i might have been tipped off okay uh -huh. All right, so we put these in for you, Valerie. Because Thank you so much. New to brings, but you know, <laughs> that's well, we love them too because they just come in an unbelievable variety of patterns and colors. And I think the theory is that the the colors are kind of a bold advertisement that don't mess with me. I am very untasty. 
Um, yep. That is sort of a way of potentially evading predation. At least that's a theory that um, is prevalent, I think. Yeah. And interestingly, you know, th these are shot with powerful lights and they're very colorful. And when we look at them to the naked eye, there's not necessarily a lot going on, which is really interesting. And early on, I, I, when I was diving and doing photography, I was wondering why they had these bold colors if they can't be seen at depth, because you know, basically uh, blue is about the only thing that's left as you get deep. Uh, but that's it's really not the story at all. They, they may be drab to my eye, but I'm not down there to eat them. And uh, a lot of the sea creatures actually can see things that we cannot see. Um, so this may be very colorful to them. Uh, again, it just kind of take yourself out of it and, and see what this, what this thing is really about. Very, very interesting. So for, for people who don't know, nudibranchs are actually slugs. So if you're one of those people who think that snails and slugs are just not very interesting creatures, you just haven't seen the marine versions of them. These are, these are sea slugs and they are spectacular. The Fabergé eggs of, sea, of, of slugs. Oh, well, look at, oh, look at the tunicate. Uh, yes. The, Ooh. <laughs> yeah, the tunicate makes a lovely uh, backdrop. Oh, it is a beautiful. Filter, um, so water comes in and that sort of sieve-like interior allows them to filter out microscopic particles from the water column and then they eject the, the water that doesn't suit them. But I'm never, I can, uh, it's amazing to me how the incredible variety of colors and patterns that nudibranchs come in. And conversely, the terrestrial versions are really rather drab in color. And I've never quite understood that. <laughs> yeah, I didn't, tasty. I haven't either. <laughs> maybe. But they're tasty. So maybe the one of them is tasty. Maybe. maybe. That's true. Maybe that's that's true. Where it came from. That's right. <laughs> so I love now, it. Now parts are down here. And these are the rhinophores, which basically are tasting the water. And these are the externalized lungs or gills, hence the term nudibranch and uh, very frilly and colorful as well. Um, some, this is just one, one variation of how their anatomy is put together. Uh, this is another one, <sighs> the phraseal perculum, sort of dangling over the, the uh, external gills or lungs here. It looks like it's looking at us. Uh, that's just basically <laughs> us waiting long enough to, to have it pose. Uh, it probably doesn't know we're there, uh, but it's nice when it's looking at the camera. And again, these are the rhinophores that are tasting the water. The mouth parts are down here somewhere. Oh, that's stunning. Oh. And this looks like a Glossodorus, another type of, um, of nudibranch. Um, same kind of basic uh, anatomy with the rhinophores up front and the gills in the back. Um, but, you know, just an endless variety of shapes and colors. This particular nudibranch I found in Anilau, Philippines. It's which a Rastafarian nudibranch. Uh, he, <laughs> he's pretty happening, I think. Uh, That's great. Uh, maybe a Medusa one. But, uh, so Rhinophor is here, I guess. And, mm -hmm. oh, no, no, I'm sorry, here, I think. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mouth, mouth parts here, and then these are all the mm -hmm. lungs. Yeah. Very different arrangement. So Anilau yeah. is another of one of those areas that's very famous for muck diving. And, uh, oh. you know, it, it uh, man, we were only, we spent a week there and it took me like two years to process all the images. <laughs> it was so productive, <laughs> ridiculous. I believe it. I believe it. These are incredible. Well, this is kind of a cousin, so to speak, of a nudibranch. This is actually a flatworm. Um, flatworm. This was taken in Fiji. And, um, you know, some people call these magic carpets because sometimes they, um, although this one is, you know, resting on a sponge, sometimes you will see them kind of undulate, sort of swim like a magic carpet uh, through the water column. So one of the wonderful <laughs> things about, uh, I'm sure you saw it right yeah. away. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so you know, some, some animals hide in plain sight. And it's a you know, wonderful eye training thing, especially for radiologists to find these creatures. Um, and you know, the feature creature here, of course, is this gorgeous orange frogfish, which is uh, pretending to be a sponge. And I, it's probably no coincidence that its color so closely resembles those tabastra. I don't know. It would look black to us at this depth. And this is a black sponge. Usually they're better matched than this. That's one of the reasons I actually liked this shot was it was so mismatched because usually they're going to be spot on. 
Uh, and I'll show you, I think, on the next one uh, where it's a little bit more successful. So here's another frogfish, and we think this guy did a pretty good job of matching himself to those clumps of white uh, sponge, sponge all around. Yep. yep. A little bit of pink. So it basically has a lure on top of its head and that it sends out on a little fishing pole and dances around like, a, like it's a little bait fish, literally. And it holds perfectly still until something comes along to investigate its bait on the, on, the, uh, on the pole and it springs into action lightning fast, mouth opens up like a- A giant maw. Like a tr giant trap and basically sucks the animal in. And it happens in blink of an eye or faster yeah. than blink of an eye. Crazy, crazy fast. These are masters of disguise. I vividly remember the very first time I found a frogfish on my own. It was in Hawaii and it was a huge one by frogfish standards. The ones we've shown you are probably maybe three inches long, maybe three, four inches. The one I found in Hawaii was like the size of a basketball. And I literally stared at it for five minutes trying to decide if it was a sponge or a frogfish. I finally found the eye and the mouth, but it, it really took me a while to convince myself that it was a frogfish. That's huge. That, that I've... I, yes, they're oh. probably the biggest we've seen. That's probably seen. the biggest one I've ever yeah. seen. Yeah, yeah. It's sometimes what we do, in, in uh, again, for underwater photography, uh, especially if we don't really have a great subject at, at hand at the moment, is find a really nice uh, substrate uh, basically a stage or a diorama and wait for something to swim into it that looks interesting. Uh, and this is a tunicate encrusted uh, sea squirt with a soft crawl behind it. And it was just such a nice composition that uh, I waited for this little Toby to come over and get in position. So that's sometimes it's like, it's like setting up a little studio underwater. Uh, it's, this is a pretty backdrop and whatever animal comes in uh, uh, will be my subject. And uh, that's another so you wait and, and hope. hope. Wait and hope. <laughs> and sometimes uh, have nothing or just have uh, the substrate without, uh, without the animal as you are setting it up and making sure your lighting is correct. That is remarkable. That is okay, absolutely remarkable. Oh, Six to seven foot shark. It's totally possible. So some animals we mentioned just hide out in the open like those frogfish, which are well disguised like sponges. But some animals can just sit where right where they are because they're so well matched to say the sand that they're on. This particular guy has another weapon in his arsenal, which is he was hiding behind a thick, thick curtain of bait fish. So literally this curtain was so thick that unless you approach this shark within inches, that had the effect of pushing the curtain of fish that was hiding him back enough to actually see the shark. So not only is it blend in, it's very flat and it has the frilliness around it to basically still blur its margins even more with the substrate. And just like the frogfish, they will barely move. You know, some sharks need to swim to breathe. Uh, this guy is able to basically wait it out, barely move a muscle, barely push any water through its gills. Well, they call this a carpet shark, with, which gives you an idea of its rather sedentary nature. And um, you know, so this is a wobegong shark. There's a, a couple of different types, but this is the one that's uh, native to Air, uh, to Indonesia. Not Arizona. Not Arizona. <laughs> it came back from Arizona. So the body is actually, it's back here somewhere, probably in a deep crevice, and it's going to go off like a regular shark with and the one dorsal of this, fin. You can point out the eyes. Right here. Here. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Pretty much the only thing that gives it away as an animal. Oh, what a shot. <laughs> this is also a Wobegong shark. Probably also about seven feet long. Oh, uh, also man. pretty easy to swim over. Surprisingly uh, when easy. It's, mm -hmm. Yeah, when it's doing its uh, thing, which is basically being a, a carpet. Um, mm -hmm. This guy decided he was moving uh, camp uh, from one place to another. And I'm guessing that uh, they become a little hypoxic from barely barely breathing. I think a lot of ambush predators do this. And then they will give a big yawn or two in a row, which some photographers uh, wait for. I've never seen this before. I've never seen a Wobi Gong um, taking a big yawn. But, you know, he looks, he looks like, a, like a floor mat, but all of a sudden he's now a face full of teeth and a giant gaping mouth. Um, so he means business. And, and when he's doing his job right, uh, his prey doesn't really stand much of a chance. 
That's the decision. Here's another uh, ambush predator. Uh, scorpion, no, no, no scorpion oh fish. This is, a, this is a, a, a crocodile fish. Yeah, it looks like a crocodile fish. And uh, also blends in with the substrate and even has these shades over the eyes to basically break up the pattern of a round, dark dot of the eye itself. So mm -hmm. it is flat, it is colored like the substrate, and like the other animals we, we, sh we showed you, they, uh, they barely move a muscle until, until, they, until they don't. And then in this particular case, you could see he's actually sucked in a fairly good sized scorpion fish uh, into its gullet. And the scorpion fish is very much alive and I'm sure very unhappy. Uh, best scenario for the scorpion fish is one of its dorsal spines uh, goes to the wrong place in this guy's throat and, and he basically coughs him up. This guy was not going to give him up. Uh, and the reason I got this shot in the first place is, is he was basically, it looked like it was hiccuping to, and he was basically sucking in it more and more water to try to get it farther and farther back in his gullet. Uh, and uh, I, I saw that motion and went over and I was really surprised that I could see this, this poor fish inside. And it yeah, in fact, you can see its mouth. Uh, here right? Yes. Yeah, you I, have I, I so that. many shots that are like, I keep thinking to myself that that's like the shot of a lifetime. <laughs> And you have so many of them. Uh, because lightning it, it, quick reflexes, it's incredible. Unbelievable. It's truly, it's truly unbelievable. We were diving, uh, this is also in Indonesia, and it's not to say that there aren't other wonderful places. We, this has just been our rut, this going to the beautiful uh, island country of Indonesia. This guy is a little night feeding um, uh, cuttlefish. Tiny. Uh, maybe, maybe, maybe an inch, inch long. Maybe. And we're diving actually a coral farm uh, that had been raided and, and robbed not too long ago, but we had uh, permission to dive it. And uh, uh, I was, I, he looked so vulnerable, he or she looked so vulnerable. Uh, I had to shoot him, the coloration was interesting. Uh, and just wondered, what are you doing out here? Something's going to eat you. And it wasn't until I got it on my computer and saw that his tentacles are absolutely filled with food. He the has shrimp looks like shrimp. He has been, she has been feeding uh, very successfully and, and has a giant basket of food going on there. So that's insane. Yeah. That is absolutely insane. This original is a fierce warrior. Yeah. A tiny, oh one, but a fierce warrior. tiny yes. It, yes. Though. Absolutely underestimated it. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> this is a pretty amazing <clears throat> shot of Steve's because this guy is. <sighs> Tiny and translucent, and in the water column. And so, in was, other words, you're not, at night. you're not, and it's at night, and it, it's there's nothing to stabilize you. You're not like yep. uh, on the ground, or you're like in the water column. And somehow he managed to get a shot of this translucent shrimp. I'll let him explain what's going on uh, physiologically here. So we were diving, and we were hoping to uh, shoot uh, some colorful or. Uh, 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 cuttlefish that were night feeding, very colorful. And uh, I started seeing these little flashes of uh, blue-green light uh, in, the, in the water column and on the substrate on the sand. And I hadn't ever noticed this before. I'm sure it was just me that I just, you don't look for things that you don't understand or, or even know are there. And I went down to investigate some of these flashes of light and occasionally I'd see this little shrimp-like creature near them. Uh, and it wasn't until I got the shot, and I can tell you that uh, um, I probably shot 30 or 40 shots of, of nothing. Uh, and we're very lucky to get this one in intact in focus. This one actually is a, a National Geographic children's book now. Um, I will tell you that it uh, probably is evading predation by sending off a little plume of, of, uh, of bioluminescence. They, they shoot out like it from 2A and 2B some chemical that when it mixes it it flashes for a second and as soon as they send out the flash they, they jet off they jet off maybe a foot away so if a prey comes over to investigate the flash of light they're already long gone um, so i added the light because obviously it was with a strobe but there's no way i could see a flash of bioluminescence so this is basically what my eye saw uh, but not exactly what the camera saw the camera just saw this little creature that that I think is one where I can't believe I have to say this, but we're going to have to stop because I think that um, 
we're going to get cut off for time. Ooh, okay. um, I know. I, I this is killing me. I need to. I, I need to tell you that I, I have seen you know some of your shots uh, on your website. These are truly extraordinary. I, first of all, I can't believe you don't do this full time. Um, that this is a, a side gig is kind of blowing. It's just been blowing my mind the whole time. And it's not just, I mean, you see a lot of amazing underwater photos. People go to coral reefs and there's so many beautiful things to see, but, but your, your eye, both of you, your eyes, your ability to get almost the impossible shot over and over and over again is, is, it's, in, it's just insane. So I want to make sure that we let everybody know that um, they can get more information. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> they can get more information. <laughs> what kind of camera it takes to do, just to give people an idea what kind of camera it takes to do this. <laughs> that's incredible. That's it's a monster. monster. Look, it's Maria just, in a cave in, in Mexico. It's, it's a monster. <laughs> yeah. That is, yeah, no, I'm actually really glad that you have this because people have no idea just the gear it takes to go scuba diving in the first place, let alone to do professional level photography is, is insane. But um, your contact information, uh, your webpage for, uh, for everything, all of your Instagram accounts, everything will be down below in the description box of wherever folks are watching this video right now. And I, I, I honestly hate to cut you guys off because like, <laughs> I hope that everyone enjoyed this journey as much as I did. I have to say I'm pretty biased because for me, the underwater realm is, is my happy place. And I have to say, uh, you, you guys, your photos just blew me away and definitely gave me the little jolt of, of happiness and inspiration that I needed just because the world is so crazy right now. But yeah. the fact that people can see how remarkable the natural world is, I hope that uh, that can be an inspiration to people that, uh, you know, we will get through this, the world will, will go on. Maybe the and, ocean um, will be feeling a bit uh, while we're taking a rest from it. Yes, I think that's true. But I just wanna say thank you both so much for taking the time oh, to share all of these photos with me. This was fine. with us. Sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm like totally thinking about myself right now because that was just so awesome. <laughs> but uh, it was it was remarkable, and I really appreciate um, your stories and your amazing art. This is this is incredible. Um, and I should also mention that uh, on your website, there's information about the galleries and the installations that you guys have. Um, all, all over the place. And you do other types of photography, not just underwater photography. Well, of we course, do. because, you know, it, it, you know, it's my, I, my analogy is that it's like an infection. We started with underwater, but underwater took us to such great places like Galapagos and places like that, that of course we had to do land photography, which, you know, so travel, wildlife, landscape, Street. you name it, we're Actually, there. Actually, uh, drone photography has been a lot of fun. Oh yeah, the first years. shot was a drone shot, yeah. <laughs> and uh, also doing x-ray art. We. We've had stuff in several museums, um, a whole other story, but uh, very fun, forensics, uh, uh, you know. Imaging is us. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's I, I definitely, I can definitely see that. And you both have such an incredible eye and just thank you so much for sharing a little sliver of the world as you see it, because it's beautiful. It's thank truly you. beautiful. It's fun it's fun. Us. So thank you guys for watching our viewers. I hope that you enjoyed that as much as I did. And uh, again, we're going to have to keep our suitcases uh, in storage and come back and join us uh, next week. We stream live Saturdays at six o'clock. We'll have more travel, adventure and adventurers. And until then, everybody stay safe, stay healthy, and we'll see you for your next travel fix next week. Thanks so much, everyone. Thank you guys so much. Bye-bye.